welcome to the presentation of what the ND office has been doing the last two months for uh, five different mission hospital clients and helping them plan for treating COVID patients, you know, repurpose medical spaces. The India office team that's working on this has been Danielle, and Sanisha, and myself, and Caleb. So uh, what started this whole process was a, was a newsletter, a social media post that I saw from Mass Design Group, who's a kind of a peer of EMIs in this space of designing around the world um, and, and doing a lot of healthcare facilities. Um, and so they put, they've been putting out some, some, some resources. Uh, at the end of March, the World Health Organization uh, published technical resource uh, guidelines for setting up uh, treatment centers specifically for COVID-19 and based on the, the research that was available at the time. Um, there's been a lot of content put out um, about how to do this in, in a North American or European setting um, with building types there. There hasn't been a ton of content we've seen from other people, maybe a, on a typical EMI healthcare client. Uh, but one we have come across recently and, and based some of some of this work on is from a group called Bill Pelton and now they do a lot of work in Haiti and in a few sub-Saharan African countries. Um, so we've, we've been using these as, as primary guides for our work. So starting with an email, we, we floated an email out to maybe we sent it to 30 or 40 people directly and, and a few of those were representatives of groups that have, you know, dozens or in some one case a, a couple of hundred member hospitals in, in India. Uh, offering this complimentary service. We were able to, you know, like I said, we've been working for five of them. So it generally starts out with a preliminary set of questioning. The set of questions that we, we sent on is there on the left. These are some general general questions about how they plan to, to treat their patients, uh, what the government's asking them to do, so their ideas for where to treat them and how to treat them, and, and then infrastructure questions, and then some more site-specific questions as well. Uh, we've been getting a lot of the information uh, through WhatsApp conversations with uh, generally not the lead doctor who might we, we might normally work with if we're doing a traditional design project, but um, with a, a site engineer. Um, so if, if these hospitals have have a, have an engineer on their staff who oversees building and, and building projects and maintenance, that's been in our experience the best person to, to talk to to get this information to send the to send the, the plans, the videos, answer questions about utilities and things like that. Um, these aren't the decision makers. Uh, the decisions would need to be made again by the, the, the medical leadership. But uh, these are the we found that these are the, the best people to dialogue with because it, it takes quite a bit of back and forth uh, over the, the first week of working with these these hospitals to get the information. So we've asked them to send send pictures, uh, walk through videos if if possible, and then uh, various levels of plan information. So on um, the next slide, we'll see a uh, some examples of what we've had. So some of these we have been buildings that we designed, so obviously we didn't need the plans for those. Others of them have been campuses that we've been to, uh, but we had not necessarily worked on these buildings before, and still others we hadn't been to at all. So we have gotten, um, so um, we've gotten anywhere from, if it's buildings that we don't have the plans of, you know, hand sketches uh, with dimensions showing, you know, um, access and window and door locations. Uh, most of these places have have had have to have a fire evacuation plan. So, uh, one hospital had a simple one-line diagram that we ended up being able to build into uh, a full set of drawings. Um, and then one one client we, we suggested uh, they they try this app, a uh, smartphone-based app called Magic Plan, and you just take pictures of the corners of the rooms and you can stitch them all together. And they produced a really really that image there you can see produced a really really High quality. Uh, it's not perfectly accurate. There might be a five to ten percent off, but for for the purposes of what we're doing for this COVID layout work, um, certainly better than hand drawing everything. So those are some some of the ways in which we've exchanged information uh, to be able to start the work. We're, we picked one of these five hospitals as a, as an example project. To step you through how we've been doing this work, and Tanisha's going to kind of set the stage and describe uh, what this hospital is like. Okay, so the hosp one of the hospitals that we worked on, the Chinchpada Christian Hospital in uh, west western part of India, although we're talking about just one hospital, it's sort of representative of many of the rural hospitals that we worked on and will possibly work on with COVID design. From the little map in the corner, you can see the big red dot is the closest city to where this hospital is, 
which is about 120 kilometers away. This rural hospital uh, is a 50 bed hospital. They see an average of 100 to 150 patients a day in their OPD. But it's important to also understand just how this hospital functions. Where do these patients come from? What's what is the, what's the background of these patients? How does the what's the day to day functioning like of the hospital? And although none of us from the from our office have visited this hospital, we've had quite a lot of communication in the past with the with the staff here. So we feel like we could sort of understand the background of of this rural hospital in particular. Patients would likely travel far distances with their families to come and be treated at this hospital. Their families would likely stay close by and look after them during their stay at the hospital. Um, the staff all live on the campus with their families. So the plan on the right is a plan that the hospital gave us that they have. Just, and you can just see that besides the hospital, which is shown in a hatched um, area on the right, there's other buildings too that make up this hospital campus. And this is quite representative of the mission hospitals that we work that we have worked with for this COVID design. And so that just gives you a background into our design. And I think it's important, especially when we're making changes in the plans, to not completely dis disrupt the flow of, of patients and staff and the methods in which they work. And I think it's good to be sensitive to the the hospital. And I and for the designs that some of you may be working on in, in the future on, on for COVID care. I think it will be crucial for you to understand just how the hospital functions before trying to make big changes into their design so that they can take care of COVID patients. Something that we uh, learned as we were doing uh, design work for these hospitals is that some of these hospitals, especially because they were rural hospitals, were approached by the government to for them to take over their hospital and use it primarily as a COVID hospital for that region. And if that were to happen, the government would take over the functioning and the entire hospital will be used only for COVID care. But if that doesn't happen, it's likely that the hospital will start treating COVID patients and depending on how serious it gets and, then, and how quickly the numbers increase, they might change from Using, using their hospital as a partial COVID hospital and then transitioning into using the full hospital as COVID care. So on the left is a phase one approach where we would use a part of the hospital dedicated for COVID care and the remaining parts of the hospital would continue to function with their regular, with their regular treatment. A lot of care has to be taken when in the phase one approach because obviously the patients who are coming in to be treated for COVID have to be kept quite isolated from other patients in the hospital to make sure that the virus transmission is contained in, in the area and not, uh, and that doctors and medical staff moving from this space to the rest of the hospital are, um, are very careful in how they, they doff their PPE and keep the area sanitized. And then if the hospital transitions into a phase two, then a lot more of the hospital becomes used for COVID care. So you can see in phase one, there's it's important to have some sort of partitions put in place so that area that is used for COVID is, is clearly designated as COVID care so that the rest of the hospital can function. Daniel, you can continue. This hospital chinchipata that we have chosen to present, we chose it because it's the cl cleanest delineation of spaces. Um, it, it represents the concepts that we um, have been working with the best out of all the hospitals. Um, graphically, it's not the cleanest of examples because this was one that was done in AutoCAD before we kind of made our decision to move away from that. So just kind of bear that in mind as we go. So first of all, just kind of, there's various elements that we have looked at that go into this COVID planning. The very first of which being patients and patient spaces. The first line of defense in preventing the spread of COVID is segregation of patient populations based on their COVID status. This happens through screening and assessment of patients arriving at the hospitals. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about screening and assessment later um, when Tanisha shows you our prototype for a screening center. Some hospitals will choose to assess every patient upon arrival as soon as they walk through the gate. Some will choose to have some kind of pre-screening set up and then separate. We're going to use the word PUI, which um, in the course of this pandemic means patients under investigation. So they'll choose to separa separate out PUIs for further assessment. And it's important to understand how 
the hospital that you're working with plans to handle patient flow, as that will have huge impacts and, and guide your design. Out of the four populations, we'll choose to focus on three for the purpose of our designs. Just to give a quick overview, first population is non-COVID. These are people that are arriving at the hospital with no COVID symptoms whatsoever. They're showing up to have babies or have broken arms tended um, completely unrelated reasons. The second category is suspected. Um, these are patients that are presenting with COVID symptoms, but they don't have any positive test results yet. So they could have COVID, they could have an upper respiratory infection. We just don't really know. Third is confirmed. These patients have a positive COVID test, so we know they're, they definitely have COVID, um, but they are still stable and ambulatory, able to move around on their own. And then the fourth category, um, severe and acute patients. Uh, these patients have a positive test, like the confirmed patients. And they require a lot more care, whether that be oxygen or ventilator or a closer nursing supervising, and they may or not, may not be able to move around on their own. For the purpose of all of the circulations and such that you'll see as we move on, confirmed and severe and acute are lumped together in one group, um, recognizing that they're all positive patients. These populations each come with different separation requirements based on the level of risk. Suspected has the highest degree of separation because the, of the risk of disease transmission um, to possible negative cases. And so if you have five suspected people in the same room, um, one of those might not actually have COVID. And so obviously they're sick enough to be in the hospital and we definitely don't want to transmit COVID to them. So distancing among suspected populations is extremely crucial. Confirmed cases, since all patients are positive, uh, patient to patient transmission, is not a concern. We definitely still want to be careful between staff and patient interactions. The patient and patient, we can be a little more lenient on spacing and distancing. Those, All of those spaces are represented in our plans. Um, we've color-coded all the plans based on the patient population, and hopefully that'll make sense as we move forward. Looking a bit at ward layouts, the World Health Organization recommends six feet or 1.8 meters of spacing between patient beds in all wards. That's across the board, suspected, confirmed, all of them. Um, honestly, we found this can be hugely challenging to accomplish with surges in pa patient populations. Um, we don't know how many, what the ratio of suspected to confirmed patients might be. Um, in all of the documents we've been reading, I haven't seen any kind of study or any kind of um, information on that. I think it's largely dependent on how the hospital's handling testing. but. With that challenge in maintaining that six foot of separation with all populations, we've seen several guidelines that have suggested it is feasible to space confirmed and critical and severe beds at five feet instead of six feet apart. Again, because patient and patient transmission is not um, not really a concern. It should be stressed that six feet is still ideal. All efforts to maintain six feet are still great and still priority. Due to the increased risk of patient-to-patient -patient transmission in the suspected ward, really you need to go to every length possible to maintain that separation. Really the only case that that it would be appropriate to, to make that, that spacing smaller is in a situation like a, a tent hospital where the, just the dimensions of the tent are such that it's impossible. Um, and in that case, um, it's possible to put up a, a impervious partition between the beds, still maintaining five feet of separation because staff still needs to be able to move around safely around that space. But that partition is um, helps to minimize the aerosol transmission. Obviously still six plus feet is what we want to aim for at all times. An aisle of five feet minimum between toe-to-toe -to -toe beds should be maintained. It's it's less than six feet because the patient's heads are at the head of the bed, not at the foot of the bed. So if it's head-to-head -head arrangements, then that, that aisle needs to be wider. When possible, it's great to have beds arranged along or have the, the head of the patient's bed um, along the windows just to allow for fresh airflow to come in and carry contaminants away. And you also need to keep in mind as you're laying out critical and severe awards that you need to account for ventilators or oxygen, any of the equipment that will be around the bed, and just make sure that the staff are going to be able to move around those beds easily. And also when you're laying out those wards, keeping in mind that critical and severe patients are going to need a lot more nursing supervision. And so if there's a ward kind of in the spaces that you're looking at that might allow for 
more nurse supervision, um, then that might be a great place to put your critical and severe awards. The next kind of layer of looking at patient populations is patient circulation. Um, so as you see here, um, patient, there's kind of different lines for each patient population, again, with confirmed, including confirmed and critical and severe patients. And really, we're just looking at how are we getting those patients into those wards? How are they being admitted or transferred to a different ward? And then how are those patients getting to the bathroom? As much as is possible, um, it's great for different patient populations to maintain separate circulation paths. So if there's a way to have your suspected patients and your confirmed patients in different hallways or different spaces, um, again, patient, pain, patient transmission is real. Um, we want to avoid that as much as possible. It's also important to have those predetermined paths, um, have the staff very aware of those. And then as a patient is being admitted, the staff should be escorting that patient to the ward, explaining where the toilet locations are per their population and how the patient should get there. In the case that the patient is upgraded to um, a different ward, then they, the staff needs to get through that teaching process again and be sure to explain where the toilet is. Keeping separate bathrooms is a must. Um, and I think, especially in the developing world context, that can be a challenge with wanting segregation of gender to be a huge priority. Um, and of course, that is that is a huge priority, but um, really emphasizing to our clients that segregation of patient populations has to take priority over segregation of gender. And so uh, it's, it's a tough thing to kind of figure out. Sometimes that might mean building a temporary toilet block, but definitely keeping those toilets separate between populations is hugely important. This is the Chinchpada plan. On each of these, we'll go through the phase one and then the phase two plan. And so here you'll see kind of the bottom portion of the plan that Tanisha had showed us earlier. We've dedicated two, um, two of their medicine wards to be suspected patient wards for a total of nine beds, and then two of their private medical rooms um, for a total of four confirmed beds. And then the area that you see um, all of the severe and critical patients in, those are their existing ICU and ACU wards. And so they're already equipped with oxygen and ventilators. I think they only had one or two ventilators, but this is where those that care, that degree of care is typically used. Um, and so we wanted to maintain that space. And so you'll see with the dashed lines, those are the patient admitting lines. In the bottom portion of the screen, you will see um, we have confirmed and suspected patients in the same space. I know that I said before that that's not ideal. In this case, you'll have a staff member that's um, that's walking with that patient. And so that staff, staff member is gonna be cognizant of, of other patients around and able to, to direct that patient appropriately. You'll also see this toilet block here has been dedicated only to suspected patients. So we were able to maintain segregation of genders in this plan. The, the confirmed cases had their own bathrooms in the back portion of the private wards. So that was really convenient. Moving on to phase two, you'll see that same space below. We've transitioned um, the confirmed beds over to be suspected beds, as now we've, we're using the entire surgical ward and private rooms for all of our confirmed cases. So in, at this point, we have a huge number of confirmed beds, a smaller number of suspected beds, and then um, recognizing we don't really have any expansion room for more critical and severe beds, um, it is possible that we could take one of these 10-person wards up here and bring in oxygen via canisters and then have great nursing supervision because there's nursing right here between the two wards. And so it does require a good deal of flexibility just in not knowing what the patient populations, what the numbers are going to look like. But again, we're, we're making sure that we have uh, admitting going into those spaces and then no cross-contamination between pa patient populations. Next, we looked at staff flow. So proper management of staff movement is key for both the health and the safety of hospital staff and for the prevention of spread of disease. Staff need to be well-versed in infection management protocols um, and what that looks like in their context and for their hospital. And they also need to be provided with the necessary personal protection equipment or PPE, um, as well as having an understanding of the hospital's PPE protocols and proper donning and doffing techniques. We have broken this staff up into four categories based on their degree of interaction with suspected and infected patients and whether they are or are not wearing PPE at that time. So starting with clean staff, these are staff members that are arriving for their shift for the day. 
they um, are arriving from offsite or from a clean area outside of the COVID treatment area. They're entering the COVID area, but they're not wearing PPE at that point. And they might be in nursing areas or areas that are non-patient care that are considered clean areas. The second category is clean staff that are wearing PPE. Um, these are staff that have not yet interacted with patients, but they are wearing their PPE. Um, after moving through a donning area. The second, or sorry, the third category is dirty staff in PPE. These are staff that um, are still wearing their PPE. They've moved into patient care. Um, they're, they've entered the, referred to as the hot zone, contagious zone, and they need to be careful at this point not to move from confirmed and sus into suspected cases areas because they would carry germs from confirmed into suspected. And then those dirty staff move into a doffing area and then they still haven't washed yet. So they are dirty staff still. And then after that, they'll move into a clean um, or into a washing area and become clean again. And so it's kind of a giant cycle. We've provided circulation paths for each of those categories and you'll kind of see how that plays out as we move along. We've also kind of identified some key staff spaces what those look like. The staff work and storage, we've chosen the mark in blue. Um, that can include things like nursing stations, storage, staff bathrooms, staff um, break rooms. It's important to note that staff spaces located inside of patient care spaces, such as a nursing station or an equipment room, um, should be considered as dirty spaces. And so it's not fair to say that, that clean staff not in PPE should be in any of these staff spaces but only if they are outside of a, a patient care area. PPE donning areas um, are provided outside of the pa patient care areas so that PPE can be put on before any interactions. PPE do doffing areas are provided at an alternate entry or exit to that space, so we're making sure not to contaminate clean people and dirty people. And then staff wash areas are provided near the doffing areas. Since patient and staff circulation greatly constrain the locations of the doffing and wash areas, it's likely that these two spaces won't be in, a, in an actual enclosed room. With that in mind, this is uh, one doffing area. Um, it's basically just tented plastic on a lightweight frame that a hospital in the U.S. is using. And um, a space like this can be constructed in um, a vestibule, a veranda area, outside of um, whatever exit they're using, and can be a great way to contain a lot of those airborne bacteria that are coming off as you're taking your PPE off. Likewise, because, because of the location sensitivity to where the staff are interacting, it's likely that there won't be water access, um, but we also don't want dirty staff to be carrying germs through a vestibule area um, on their way to get get washed. So it's possible that you might need to establish an improvised hand wash station of some kind. Ideally, there would be proper running water and drains, but if that's not available, um, we definitely want to prioritize the proximity of, of getting clean as soon as you get out of your PPEs. Kind of to look how that would play out in phase one for Chinchpada, um, we have staff members who are coming from offsite with this solid green line, um, and they are going into this nursing station, which is considered a clean space because it's outside outside of all the patient care areas. They'll, this is an existing casualty space. We're saying that's not going to be patient care space at all right now. That's going to be nursing storage and um, clean linens and that kind of thing. And then this hatched purple area is the donning area where staff can put on their PPEs before going and doing patient care. So then once, once they've put on their PPEs, they are free to move into patient care areas, hot areas here, and then also here. Wanted to maintain some doffing areas right outside of each of these words, and so you really don't have to go more than a few steps in your dirty PPEs before you're taking those off and then before you're washing. And then once you wash, you're back in your clean without PPEs, and you're able to go back in and redoff. It's a little unclear. It, I think it's important to understand and to talk with your hospital and understand how they choose to use PPEs, recognizing that that's going to be different than how it's done here in the, in the States, where you've got a nurse that's going into a patient room and putting on clean PPEs each time they interact with an individual patient. Whereas in the developing world, um, it's possible that that nurse or doctor could be in PPEs for a good portion of the day and just never leave the high area. So that's that's a helpful thing to understand as you're lay, laying out spaces. Moving on to phase two, you'll see the same, everything is the same down below. 
and then we've added another donning station as you're entering into this um, this hot zone area of all of these confirmed cases. All interactions within this space will be dirty, and then you'll exit through this doffing area here, another wash station, and then you're free to move on either to take care of patients down here in the suspected area or to read on and go back in. This is a blow up of, uh, of what that looks like. We did end up putting in a temporary position partition here and here just to kind of stem the flow of um, patients and make sure make sure we're directing people well. One thing that I wouldn't have thought important at the beginning of this process, but that we saw to be really important um, was how hospitals are handling laundry. It's a small thing, but um, making sure that those contaminated linens are handled properly is a huge infection control concern. So in talking with different hospitals, we found it's important to figure out how they handle the laundry now, um, what that looks like, um, what their protocols are. Are they using hot water? Are they using detergent? Are they um, sun drying? Are they machine drying? The WHO has provided guidelines for handling COVID contaminated linens and making sure that they're handled and collected properly. So I won't go through the time of reading through each of these points, but basically making sure that the person who, the staff member who is collecting those linens is doing it properly, that they're equipped with PPE, that they're collecting them in a contained container, uh, a bucket with a lid, a bag with a drawstring, something that's keeping all the germs in one place, and making sure that if hot water is not being used, that they're being sanitized in a chlorine solution and then washed properly and dried properly. And just making sure, I think the biggest factor is making sure that those dirty linens from especially highly contaminated spaces like severe and confirmed are not moving into potentially less contaminated spaces like suspected. We also don't want contaminated laundry exiting through an uncontaminated don donning area either. So what that looks like in these plans, just making sure that um, that this laundry is coming out of the confirmed wards and, and nothing's crossing paths unnecessarily. So in this case, hospital laundry was located at the top, just off the page. Um, so everything was, it was a very easy design. In this case, they were using hot water, so we didn't need to didn't need to sanitize the laundry. This is a bigger picture showing all the laundry coming out and then moving down to this laundry area that was central. Um, and then showing again how those clean linens are being redistributed into the spaces. So uh, if you've been reading at all about the, the COVID situation, the airborne, the, how airborne, how infectious the airborne droplets are, they the uh, aerosol particles are is up for debate. Um, we're only six months in the, the, the research to be done. Um, but the, in the WHO guidelines released at the end of March, uh, they borrowed heavily from some of their previous work uh, with with respiratory diseases. Uh, this is still their current their current guidelines. So uh, in in areas, um, what's really good about this document as in compared to other documents is that it, this is meant for low resource. Uh, developing world settings, and uh, it's it's not assuming that there is uh, central HVAC systems. Um, it does provide some provisions for that if there are, but it, it gives also guidance for for uh, more passive systems that we're going to see in a lot of the EMI hospitals. So um, this is just an excerpt from from that document, but the, the very last line there, uh, the the recommendation is that airflow in a patient room is uh, 576 cubic meters an hour per patient. Uh, so um, you know, if you've got information about fans um, that are either there on site or that uh, can be purchased in local markets, you can look up uh, volumes from those fans and, and make relatively simple calculations that way. Uh, go to the next page and we can describe how we've been implementing that uh, so uh, this this fan here is a is kind of a commercial grade extractor fan, exhaust fan, uh, from a you know a typical Indian um, manufacturer. Uh, this there, there's various sizes. Most of this work is based on the, the typical size that's available. There there are going to be bigger fans available in some markets. There are going to be quieter fans available in some markets. Uh, but we just kind of picked an average one. This this particular fan has. Uh, can can move uh, 720 cubic meters an hour. Uh, so basically, if, we're, if possible, two fans for for every three patients. Now that's not always going to be possible based on the number of windows, the number of openings. These are pretty loud fans as well. 
Um, so we, we've kind of, as we've gotten the plans from the hospitals and, and the videos are especially helpful in the fan location uh, suggestion. Um, and then we've kept in mind the, the staff flow and the patient flow that Danielle just talked about and have, have introduced um, uh, fans and you know, placed fans in, in various openings to uh, intentionally uh, bring in uh, or push out air and, and, the, and then there will be open windows um, or other sources of, of clean air to accomplish the at least at least half of, of the WHO recommendations. So you can see, you know, in the, the medicine ward one and two there, there's fans pointing. Yeah, those are those are big um, in phase one that they have discussed. Those would be suspected uh, but not confirmed patients, and they'd be using the toilet there. So in the, the private wards, we've actually faced the fans in the other direction. Otherwise, they would be blowing um, the, the air, the exhaust from the confirmed wards into the toilet. Infected patients would be using, and which they'd have to walk right by that. So uh, it's not really scientific or not, not really, it doesn't take a whole lot of engineering. It's just kind of merging um, the information you have on, on, on where the windows are and how many patients are in a room and, and where's the best place to push this dirty air. The other wards, private wards there, this image is, is from a, a screen grab from the video. Uh, but there's there is existing um, evaporative coolers blowing air into the space because uh, it's summer, it's quite hot. And um, so we actually suggested that they turn those coolers around, take the filter medium out of them. Uh, this is going to increase the, the temperature in the room. It's not going to be as comfortable, uh, but it's going to do a better, better job of, of uh, exhausting the that, that dirty air. And then the the next slide is is kind of a uh, so we've been we've been showing these fan locations in plan and then taking um, kind of a representative uh, room and, and kind of taking an image from from the videos or, or uh, from the section information that we have and kind of showing them which windows to leave open, which windows to close, where to install the fans. Um, and if if you can uh, exhaust the air out into into an area that's not on a on a walkway or that's even maybe still within still within the COVID area on the hospital. Uh, I think just pushing it out out into into uh, open air is okay. Um, if it's going to be blowing up against uh, another part of the hospital that's not a COVID that's not a COVID uh, facility or um, it, it's it needs to be, uh, I mean, the best thing to do would be is the recommendation is to vent it, uh, so to duct it and take it above three feet above the roof level and, and, and um, exhaust it there. So uh, we've, we've made a, a recommendation like that uh, at one of the five hospitals based on that we just didn't have any options of any place, any, any place to put it. So that's kind of a quick overview of, of the ventilation strategies we've been using on these hospitals uh, that are all naturally ventilated and um, would have evaporative coolers as, as, as their only only form of kind of HVAC. Tanisha is going to introduce something that we ended up coming up with at, at a later stage for a different hospital. So we're gonna, we're gonna switch campuses here, but she's gonna talk about a, a kind of a, a fever clinic idea that, that a, a client uh, wanted. Um, so this is a different plan of a hospital. Sorry for switching designs. Help this hospital work on the, I mean, we help this hospital with the design for their COVID uh, wards. And after we'd helped them with that proposal, they, one of the comments that they shared with us was that the space that we had dedicated to be used for assessments wasn't really appropriate. They were unable to move the existing equipment out of that space um, and they wanted to use it um, as, as it was already being used. So they requested if we would be able to design um, sort of a temporary structure that would be used as an assessment center and they would continue to use it for as long as they were um, treating COVID patients. And so the, the yellow box was is the assessment center that we had decided um, to design. The location was chosen just based on what was appropriate on the campus. And the way that this hospital would function with that was that all patients that were entering the hospital would be directed to the assessment center. And um, after assessment, they would, if they were suspected of COVID, would be taken to the suspected wards. And if not, they would be moved to the, uh, to the OPD for other treatment. 
Um, something that we learned was quite important in, in this hospital and likely for other hospitals in, in India was that uh, hospitals receive a lot of patients with TB and a lot of the symptoms for TB are very similar to the symptoms for COVID. So patients having a high fever and a cough are possible symptoms for TB as well. So what the difference between those two patients would be seen through an X-ray. And so part of the assessments besides checking temperatures um, and checking for um, breathing difficulties or a cough or taking an actual swab for for uh, COVID testing would be to take an X-ray and this would determine whether the patient was actually a TB patient uh, and they would be directed to the existing TB ward in the hospital. So we'll move on to the next slide and we'll uh, go through just the layout of this assessment center. Spaces that are yellow are spaces that the, the patients would be using and the spaces in blue would be for the staff. The patients would enter and be directed to the to the waiting booths. Um, so these are partially covered spaces with enough breeze blowing in the, into these spaces. Um, there are four waiting booths um, just to add some degree of separation between one, from one patient to another. The patients would be directed into the patient triage area. There are two patient triage areas where their assessment would be taken and if necessary, the swab test would be done. Now, uh, what's unique to this hospital is they won't be doing any testing in their hospital, but they are likely to take samples and send them to a nearby government facility. Um, and the samples would be tested at the lab there. And so um, patients would have to wait about a day before they receive the results for the testing. But other assessments would be done, like the temperature and, the, and um, a breathing test and possibly an X-ray. So the staff, the staff would use the triage, the staff triage areas behind, and there's also spaces for storage, toilet, um, donning, doffing, and washing areas. The next slide shows a little bit more about the movement. As Danielle explained in the slides before, you can see here, this it sort of works quite similarly. Patients would come in and wait, at the air, wait in the booths and then be directed to the patient triage area. After they were tested based on whether they were going to be directed to the suspected ward or to the OPD, they would leave from the two doors on either side and then be directed with by staff to the, to the other parts of the hospital. Uh, staff arriving uh, into this clinic will not be in PPE. That's shown by the dotted green lines. They would move into the staff triage areas. But if the staff need to come out into the patient triage, they would um, don PPE and then come into the patient triage area where they would examine the patient or take a swab sample. And once they are in PPE and have, have had contact with the patient, they will exit. That's shown by the dark solid red lines. And if they need to get back into the staff triage area or have to move or leave to go to another part of the hospital, they would go into the doffing and washing area to the left of the, to the building. Um, it's also very important that between patients that these areas are well sanitized. Um, there are sinks on either side of the building which will allow um, additional washing and, sanitize and sanitation to take place. The x-ray room to the side is for any patients who are suspected of having uh, TB they'd be directed to the x-ray room and the x-ray uh, would be processed within an hour and then the patient, depending on the result, would be directed to the uh, TB ward or possibly to the uh, COVID ward. So these were these were the spaces that the hospital staff um, shared that they needed and uh, we were able to put this together. The next slide, as Andy talked about the importance of having very well ventilated spaces especially when, especially the spaces that patients are using. We've placed uh, ceiling fans in the patient triage areas and in the x-ray room. We have windows on the sides to direct air in, exhaust fans to direct air out, but we also have a lightweight roof structure where the trusses will be meshed so that air, is, air can also be directed through the top of the building. Um, the difference here is that instead of commercial grade fans, we'd be using smaller residential exhaust fans just because these spaces are much smaller. Um, so this was our proposal for an assessment center. I think um, they will be most likely building this and starting to use it pretty soon. Some images of the of the 3D and that's all uh, that's all I have. 
Yeah, so that's, that's the uh, prepared content. We are happy to answer any questions that you have. Hey, Andy, uh, can you guys hear me? Rex here. How, how has this been received by the hospital? Has it worked out well? Has there been any spikes in COVID? Uh, we're actually not sure if any of the five actually have seen a COVID patient yet. The, the five that got in touch were, were doing so in anticipation of, of maybe needing this uh, when it uh, further down the line. Um, but uh, so far, the Indian government has been funneling people to government facilities that are that are like district hospitals, government facilities, and in, in uh, cities like Delhi, like Mumbai, there's been a lot of spillover into private facilities. Uh, but in rural areas, there has not been as much spillover yet. Uh, I think that that's going to change very, very soon. Hey, this is Dan. So yeah, so thanks for the presentations. It's super helpful. And I can see the, a lot of these concepts. Um, applying to more than just the, the hospital buildings. There's a lot of buildings that could um, take those ideas. But I was just curious, I know that um, not having a chance to visit a site is super challenging. And how has that been for especially hospitals? Um, the programming piece, were, was it okay with, uh, I guess, the site representative? We've been to three of the five that we, we've designed. and the other two had really, really excellent site engineers who really um, did a great job of getting it, getting us everything we asked for very quickly, um, giving us more than we asked for in a lot of cases. Uh, they're, they're very, very motivated and very, very capable. Um, it certainly uh, helps that uh, the, we're used to working in this type of hospital. I think the, the rural hospital uh, in Chinchpada that Tanisha described, we actually haven't even been there. Uh, but based on it's it's just it's it's run uh, it's part of the same organization that we work for many of their their hospitals. They're um, they're they're run quite similarly, um, and so we feel like we understand how the Indian rural medical medicine system works in these mission hospitals. So that that certainly helps. Is it as good as being there? Certainly not. Felt like it was enough information. That, that we could come up with something that would be at least somewhat helpful. I think there was also a lot um, just of back and forth interaction. If there was a question that we had that um, was really pertinent to the design, um, just a lot of screen grabs and marking up pictures and um, and asking clarifying questions. Hey, can you get a shot of this space from this angle? Um, because we, we need to understand how the, the flow works in the space better. Um, and so having this um, ongoing conversations via WhatsApp um, with the site engineers was hugely important with clarifying things and helping us to move forward. So yeah, that, that makes sense now. So they're all buildings you visited previously or you had established relationships with ministry clients who you knew and you knew their operations. Yeah, thank you all for putting this together. It was great. But I did have a couple of questions about um, how are they handling um, food and even um, are they allowing visitors? Are they allowing guardians or even how is it that they're doing food? And if it's guardians, are they doing donning, doffing? Are they allowed in the space? Um, I think you're right, uh, Ben. The, the general practice is for families to to stay with the, the patient to provide them with food. Um, but most of these hospitals also have a, a canteen on site on campus. And um, when we talked to Umri about this, I think we, we mentioned that it would be wise for them to provide food for patients. Because as you mentioned, obviously family members coming in, donning and doffing would just create a lot more I mean, it's just more confusing for the processes and the and the circulation of staff and patients and families. But I think um, it definitely makes sense for the hospitals to provide food for patients, for COVID patients, just to avoid more people in those areas. But that would be that would require, I mean, a different, I mean, changing the system that they already have. And I think that would be necessary. Um, I, I was uh, particularly intrigued by kind of your, your, your bringing it over to the TB side. 
um, because since I was in Haiti and we we're doing a, a medical center there, now building a new campus and part of it, uh, screening for TB. And I'm just wondering, did some of the this learning come from that kind of an experience? TB obviously has been around for a long time. So has, has some of that, did you get some of that from the TB experience or, or was this new and then uh, maybe it wasn't done quite as thoroughly with the TB and this will actually help inform that process. That's an interesting question because um, as we were discussing this design with Chinchipata Hospital, they are interested in um, having EMI design a TB ward for them because they have a lot of TB patients and they need a new isolation unit. And I think a lot of the same principles of, of air circulation will be very relevant to that design if we if we are able to help them. Um, I haven't personally worked on TB wards, so I don't really know the, the thought that goes into it, but certainly what I've learned from this will definitely help in future isolation ward designs. But the, the most of what we've, we've learned from this is from the hospitals telling us what they need. Um, Umri Hospital told us that they wanted an extra unit as part of the assessment, and I was curious as to why until they explained that the patients who come will likely have TB and we need to screen them for TB as well as COVID. Um, so that's part of the learning experience we've had. Grant, to answer your question about the research, I, I think it's uh, one of the documents we have in our, in our folder there is a, is a ven uh, air ventilation document from the WHO uh, uh, talking about how to do how to do that natural ventilation well in, in these kind of environments. Um, and so I think it's, you know, again, we're just six months into this. I think uh, that from looking at those two documents, a lot of the material has, has been borrowed from previous respiratory uh, research and guidance, um, TB being being the major part of it. I think uh, Ben's talking about, uh, you, know, you know, these studies coming out, and, and I, I think over the course of the next months and years, we'll we'll see uh, maybe some departures from from some of the, some of the, the TB guidance, but I think a lot of it right now seems to be pretty pretty well informed from from that. Um, Israel Nanaraj, EMI board member, uh, EMI global board member, uh, and an active network member here in India, has done a lot of TB facilities in India, uh, both in uh, you know, more urban hospitals that might have HVAC systems, but also in, in more rural places as well. Um, so he's going to be a really good resource uh, for us as, as, as we're designing uh, maybe this TB ward in Chinchapada, but uh, he loves to be on um, you know, other settings in EMI, other projects in EMI too. So he's a, he's a great resource on this. Was the uh, the, the X-ray room for that you're going to build into this? Is, is that uh, a, a brand new X-ray room? No, this is a, a new space. They said they have um, a mobile X-ray uh, unit that they would move to the, to be used in this space, and they have one that will continue to be used for their hospital. And I was interested in hearing just kind of what you all feel like you've been finding and how it differs. How how does the response to developing world COVID-19 differ from the response to developed world COVID-19 response? I think the principle is the same. Uh, so when, you know, we found very little documentation on, on other, anybody else doing this. Uh, this building, Health International, they're the only ones that have published anything that uh, of, of anything similar to this. Um, but when when you read a document from HKS or from Perkins and Will or from the you know uh, U.S. healthcare leaders, um, we've we've been reading it through the eyes of uh, of you know how does this apply to an Indian setting, and uh, I think the principles of of uh, of, uh, negative, uh, of negative air pressure, of uh, you know, con conservation of PPE, uh, of these, these kind of principles uh, would look, uh, you know, while, while actually how to do them in, a, in an American hospital is maybe completely different from how to do it in rural India, the principles apply. Um, and so that's what we've been trying to boil down is and, and take from that, that kind of guidance is, is the principles in that and then how to how, how, how that might apply in, in our setting here. You know, you can you think of a kind of a, a practical example of how we how we've done that? Uh, I think 
like the PPE doffing area is the first thing that comes to mind and just, um, okay, in a U.S. context that is going to be set up outside of a patient room and every patient room that's COVID is going to have a doffing area um, because they're set up as individual patient rooms, not as wards. And so in the case um, of an, an Indian context or a developing world context, um, you're likely going to have, um, I think just even reading some news articles, like you'll have um, doctors and, and nursing staff that are wearing their PPE for the broad majority of the day. Um, and they're staying in that ward, they're staying in that contaminated space. Um, and so how do we adapt um, how people are wearing PPE and providing provisions for um, for donning and doffing in that context? What do you think the biggest challenge to hospitals in developing world is to responding? We, so I've, two, we've got two kind of uh, in form of prayer requests reports from other hospitals that we know about that we have not worked for. One is a hospital in Mumbai, you know, is a very urban, very urban hospital. Um, they've been they've been having COVID patients for, for more than a month uh, when we got this report. Not a single staff of theirs had gotten sick. And then Frank Taxter forwarded me an email two nights ago from a, a client that we uh, talked to about a design project up in North India. Uh, it's a small, uh, primarily labor and delivery hospital and they just tested their whole staff and their, their main uh, OBGYN doctor and 10 of their staff and families are sick. And so certainly they've probably been taking different, different levels of precaution, maybe different, they, they have different equipment available to them. Maybe their knowledge about keeping their staff safe has been different, but I think the guys in Mumbai attributed it to just the Lord's protection over their staff. Prayer request from the hospital in North India it was was really just like we don't know that the tone communicated was we, we just have no idea how we're going to functioning if all of our staff or half of our staff is sick and so i think that's primary concern uh and challenge for uh a for for an emi mission hospital client would be protection of their staff because they don't have just piles and piles of reserve nurses or people they could call in and like you know, the people they have working there are, are, are the people that they have to treat their, their patients. And, and if half of them are sick, they're going to be really hurting to be able to, to deliver care. So I think that's the, and that's kind of what we've been focusing on the most, uh, is how, how do we keep staff as safe as possible? How do we reduce their risk as much as possible? Because um, I think that that's, that's the primary concern here. I was actually wondering, um, I, I really, it was really interesting seeing like how these current hospitals were being kind of, um, I guess like almost in a way like retrofitted into like a COVID situation. Do you guys see any need for maybe doing this with, um, if there weren't enough beds like, or um, using like a dorm room setting uh, and kind of using it as like isolation or like a quarantine blocks? Do you see any, do you, do you see any opportunity where EMI could be helping in that way? Or if, I don't know, something along like a, yeah, like a building that isn't a hospital kind of being um, used in a, used in a COVID situation. Yeah, the first uh, design that we, we did to do this whole thing off, uh, was for a hospital on a campus, but the, the building they chose to make their COVID unit was actually a training center. So it had dorm rooms, it had a, a of a, a large training hall and toilets associated with that. And so that was what they had chosen to make their COVID unit separate from, um, from their, by, by at least 100 meters uh, from their, their, their main hospital building. Um, here in Delhi, uh, they just made an announcement that uh, four of the large private hospitals in our part of town have parked nearby hotels to uh, surge capacity. Um, so I, I think to, to do that at a large scale it takes, it takes uh, a lot of uh, central organization, uh, which um, is, is hard to do in, in India, uh, especially in a, in a crisis situation like this. Uh, so while we have not yet heard from um, uh, from other uh, other clients who you know aren't med medical providers already, uh, but like. For example, Umri, as they've been talking to the government, the government said, you know, we want 
uh, 200 beds. Well, they only have 100 beds, so there, there there is a school campus, school building on their campus. So, you know, they're they're like, well, maybe we could put non-critical patients up at the school up the hill, uh, things like that. So, uh, we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll see if there's time to these, these hospitals end up having time to, to implement these things. Thanks for attending and uh, showing interest in, in this. Feel free to um, get in touch if you've got other questions. Thank you.